Hello, everyone. Hi, Melved. How are you? Oh, hello, hello, Sulema. I'm ready. I'm doing great. I'm so happy to see you. And in like your bright pink, uh, Melved, if you can't see her, I was on a bright pink blazer. Um, Melved, I'm just so happy to be here and to have like another conversation on everything that is happening. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Sulema Gomez and I'm the Director of Implementation at the National Parent Leadership Institute. I'm also uh, a mom uh, here in Southern California. Melved, who are you? Who am I? Um... I, I'm a parent also, and I am the policy and um, I would say capacity building consultant at NPLI. I also work in the state of Connecticut um, at the Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity and Opportunity, very long name, but really it's about equity and access for all. So, so glad to be here and chopping it up with you in this conversation. Yeah, I feel like it's been a while. Um, and before we go on, just a big thank you to um, Carlos Maldonado also, who is our podcast producer. So thank you, Carlos. Big thanks to you uh, for making this happen. There is a lot that has happened since we last spoken, both in like the national arena and personally in, in life, in our professional, personal lives. Um, I think the biggest thing that I want to get to is to hear you announce like a really big change in your career or in your title. Um, and so uh, are you ready? Are you ready to share? I'm ready. I'm ready. So um, back in May, I um, accepted a new role at the commission. And uh, so I went from being the associate director of parent leadership and family engagement to now leading the commission as the executive director. So I'm excited and actually humbled and on some days a little nervous and scared, but it's great. Um, so I, I'm excited about it. It's a team of eight policy analysts that work on policy related to women, children, seniors. Also, we have uh, analysts who work on African-American policy, as well as Latino and Puerto Rican affairs and also Asian American Pacific Islander issues. So, um, and all the intersectionality that occurs across all those groups. And so I'm excited about the opportunity to really lead in that way. And then of course, we'll, we'll, we have an open position, the position that I vacated, um, which is a position that works across all policy areas. So it really focuses on family uh, policy and family economic mobility, and of course, parent leadership and family engagement. So it's, it's quite a robust team, um, quite a unique responsibility. Sometimes I really feel the weight of it, um, but I'm excited about it. Yeah. 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 And for those who don't know, the commission is really the birthplace of the Parent Leadership Training Institute work and curriculum. And as NPLI, we are um, partners and we are stewards of the curriculum and really expanding the work um, nationwide. Um, and I, I know you sort of like, kind of like brush it off, but you know, I, this is a really big deal, right? I've known you for many, many years and, um, and I know a little bit of your personal journey as a parent leader, also that worked in corporate America and are now in this position um, in state government. And I am just awed and inspired by you and the work that you do and the work that you'll get to do. Sort of like the potential of the impact is exciting um, and in your hands. Um, and I, I just wonder if you could share with those who are listening a little bit about like how you got here. It is so um, interesting, quite bizarre, I would say, um, when we think about how I am now sitting in this seat. So I took PLTI about 20 years ago. Actually, it's 20 years. And I've said that a few times, maybe even on this podcast. Uh, I, I walked into my PLTI retreat January uh, 2004. And that's because of that. That's why I am where I am now. Um, I graduated PLTI in June of 2024. My project was called SHARE. It was supporting health advocacy and resource exchange for parents who had children with special needs. I was doing a lot of work um, for myself and my own family around advocating for children with special needs and who needed different supports in schools. And that was the launch pad for 
the next 20 years where I continue to stay involved. I would have to give a big old shout out to Patty Kekison, who was my site coordinator and facilitator and who became my friend over many years. We are still friends. Um, and it was Patty who kept me connected to our PLTI family in Danbury, Connecticut and to opportunities. And so when um, NPLI was forming as a nonprofit, she approached me and was like, do you want to come and do some work with us? And there's also a job over there at the commission. Uh, we need someone to run PLTI. And um, I interviewed for that. And I never thought I would work in parent leadership or in state government or any of the things. I had a marketing background. And so, so that was back in 2016. Fast forward, I was at the commission doing this work, leading PLTI, also uh, working with our state's two generational initiative, which is a strategy to help uh, families move towards self-sufficiency. So to move from surviving to thriving and really look at how we support families' economic mobility. And that has been the journey over uh, the course of the years and really just uh, growing a love for policy um, and, and using my problem solving skills. Uh, like we say in session 13, public policy's intention is to solve public problems. And so I take that, uh, that up with me every single day and that's the trajectory. So moving from a parent leader, um, who came in and didn't know the potential for what was to come. And really, I think accepting the call, uh, to serve because it's a decision that we all get to make. And you never know when you sign up and you raise your hand and say, I'll do this thing, what the end might be and what the future holds. And so never would I imagine that I would be here um, as the executive director of the Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity and Opportunity. And I continue to be able to carry that torch forward that Elaine lit, Elaine Zimmerman lit back in 1992 and um and hold plti dear in my heart so that's that's how i got here congratulations thank you yeah i, I think you, when i hear your story i think of so many other plti parent leaders across the country um, who either haven't entered a career space where they're happy or they're you know they are in a specific um career area but this work the training through plti the networking that you build um, it creates all of these different pathways. Yeah. Um, and here you are like five, 10 years later, right? Just in a different place. You know, I come from early childhood education, like solidly ECE doing that work. And, um, and it was for the love of the little ones and, and sort of like the violence we were seeing in our community that led me to PLTI. And to say that I get to do like civics and democracy work, like never ever imagined, right? Um, and, and it's definitely joy work. I'm just so happy. Happy for you. Congratulations. Um, and we'll be seeing Thank you. what's coming out of the state of Connecticut through you. Thank you. A yeah. So uh, lots happening um, in our work. You know, both you and I have been doing, um, you know, a couple of different events across the country, which really allows us to interface in different ways and partner with parent leaders and, um, and civic leaders. And uh, in May, and Carlos was also with us, um, several of us from the NPLI team, we, we got to be at the U Plans National Convening. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to share a little bit about that experience because it, it's really um, impacted my leadership since I returned. Um, and so for those who don't know, U Plan is United Parent Leadership Action Network. Um, and it's a, a larger network, uh, national network, that really brings together parent leadership organizations. Um, and so there's member organizations and, um, and together as a collective, we strategize on a couple of policy goals and every two years go to the um, nation's capital to meet with legislators there. Um, and, and sometimes um, with the administration, you know, on different like policy issues, both in education, domestic policy, um, and we make our ask, right? And so this time we uh, were asking for a couple of additional provisions and changes in the area of um, immigration, education, and really authentically asking for uh, parent leadership or parent partnership. So for our policymakers to 
work with parents, both locally and at the federal level, when they're writing policy, when they're considering changing of laws or appropriations bills, things like that. Um, and it, it was a great experience. We were about 200 folks in DC and we got to go with, you know, parent leaders that had graduated PLTI. Um, uh, so we were there with the dad from Memphis and, and, a, and a mom from Jacksonville and some folks from our Kansas City PLTI community. So it was just wonderful to be in community with them. Um, but one of the experiences that really stood with me is, uh, you know, I was there with a dad from Memphis where all of the legislators that we got to meet from his community were very conservative in their mm -hmm. policy stance. Mm -hmm. And here we are asking for like additional provisions in like um, uh, in DACA, right? So for dreamers to have right. um, extended benefits and things like that. Um, and uh, this parent leader really went into this experience like knowing or, or having an idea of how they might react to some of these asks. And, you know, I'm from a state uh, that's that's fairly um, liberal or progressive, some might say, around some of the issues that we were advocating around. And very rarely do I get to hear as a parent leader, no, I don't stand for those things. Um, it's, it's usually more like, well, the budget or this takes time, but it's never like a no, we don't agree, right? It's, it's very rare if, and I just haven't had that experience at all with anyone that says that. Um, and so I was curious to see like how the, this would go. Would we find common ground? Would it be confrontational? I didn't really know. Um, and I will say that it was like an, a lovely experience. Um, and so, uh, you know, we had three different meetings and as we're asking for some of these things, our parent leader, right away knew sort of like common ground, right? He's a business owner. Right. And then it was like the dad stuff and then, you know, some of the policy asks. And what I learned is that, you know, especially legislative staff would say, well, the Senator won't support that, but this is what we're doing, mm -hmm. right? And so that happened a couple of times where it was, well, it, it was a no for sure, but this is what we're doing in education or this is what we're doing. And so what I learned with, with this conversation is that like, our kids and education specifically is the common ground to build on, right? right. And so it, it did allow us to make the ask of, okay, well, as you're writing some of those bills, have you asked parents what they think about the language or the provisions? And, you know, in one instance we heard, well, we're meeting with constituents, but did you meet with parents? Right. No. And, you know, and so then what we offered was, well, we could be that collective, right? So you have our information and so, you know, what, what I was able to say is all we're asking is that when you're in these rooms, writing the language for these bills is that someone in the room asks, like, has anyone shown this to parents? What are the parents saying around this? Um, and, and again, we didn't get very far in some of the other things, but it wasn't ugly. It wasn't disrespectful. And, you know, we survived the no's, right? We, we heard no's on a couple of things right. and it was just Right. And we were able to find common ground. And for me as a civic leader, as a parent leader specifically, it was great to know that the no's don't end the conversation. Yeah. You just sort of like keep working through it. Right. Um, and uh, and you survive and you still walk with your head held high because you've done the work of advocating for those who aren't in the room with you. Um, and I really left sort of like craving more of that, like, space with opposition or difference of opinion. Yeah. Um, and, and since then have been able to speak to conservative leaders in my own community to find that common place. Yes. Right. And, and just to like get in conversation and um, it, it, it was a really great like growth experience for me. That That's so interesting. Um, and definitely I think encouraging when we think about it, we're not always warring. We're not always, you know, in combat with opposition, right? There are conversations that could be had at the table. You said it was quite lovely. Um, and there were some yes, buts, or maybe even some yes, ands. Um, but they also got to hear from this group of constituents, right? What they're thinking. And certainly they take that back. Um, even, you know, in some of our work in Connecticut, where um, you know, some things feel very partisan, uh, some, some um, issues around family. 
and family supports and public benefits. But when you come together with both sides and it's like, what, what is it that we all want? We all want people to have jobs. We want people to have opportunities. We want people to have food and shelter and all those things, right? Like sometimes it's even starting at the very basics for you, your, your, your place to start was education, right? Everybody can get around children and education. And so I think even for our parents and community, it's, and we talk about this in PLTI, especially in that session around coalitions and coalition building. Um, what is the thing that you all can unite around together with that, that small thing and then start from there. Um, I'm going to take it even back to retreat, right? When we, um, when we get in the space and we're like, Hey, what do we have in common? We're, you know, did you come from a large community or a small community? And so sometimes um, things that are outside of the issue are the things that can bring us together as well. Um, hey, I like corn. Who likes corn? <laughs> right? Like, who in the room likes corn? Who go? How do you like your corn? I like my corn, you know, creamed. I like mine grilled. Right. So sometimes it's even starting with something simple outside of the issue that you're going to be approaching starts to build a relationship and consensus and then you can go to the harder things. I love it. I love it. I'm glad you all had that experience. Yeah. I mean, and I really thought a lot of you, because I think in, in many of the years that I've known you, you've sort of been like the Jiminy Cricket on my shoulder. That is like, you work across the aisle, right? And, yeah. and it's sort of like the, the nonpartisan view of certain policy issues um, or bipartisan view. And that has been a little bit harder for me to embrace and you know that yeah <laughs> so i think it, like, it, it was really good um and so I, I appreciate you like always bringing that up and and like okay now i'm i get you mel you get it you get it you, like it works i saw it happen that's awesome we um so you were um so you did you plan with parents you said it was about 200 of you all in just the that's in right dc um so I was at the uh, Children's Defense Fund Freedom School National Training last week, and it was amazing. I walked into a room of about 1,500 people, and I was like, wow. these are my people. These are, the energy was through the roof, and um, there were people there who looked a lot like me. That always makes me feel great, even though I do in, like being in spaces where people are different. Uh, but I was like, these are my people. They were talking my talk. And they, they also embody very similar values that we do in PLTI and also at NPLI. Um, I really appreciated how they were very intentional about the history of the Freedom School movement. And that was a thread that was continued to you know be pulled throughout. Um, and also the importance of partnering with families and community um, to continue the movement, right? To continue the movement of education for um, those who are disenfranchised and for our black and brown children, um, as they refer to many, many times as our babies. Um, and so there was, I think the energy was um, in abundance, I would say 50% because of the work itself, but also because of the people in the room, a lot of them were young college students, right? And so this generation, uh, these Gen Z, Gen Y folks um, bring a different level of energy and enthusiasm and sense of purpose as they look toward the future. Um, so it was amazing. It was amazing and, and so, so much gratitude for them inviting us to be in that space um, and to present a workshop Actually, we had two workshops. Our Q&A wound up actually being two times because there were so many people who were interested in parent leadership and how to engage parents. So that was amazing. And it was at the beautiful Alex Haley Farm in Clinton, Tennessee. Um, it was also, I think this is a good bridge, but it was also really interesting because while we were there, and this happens to me a lot when I'm traveling, when I'm traveling, like there are things that are happening in the world, like decisions are being made. While I was there, right, it was the the news of 
you know, former. What news are you referring to? Was there like a big, yeah. like a big news story? There was a story big news story. Um, and, and this is important based on where I was, right? And it goes back to that conversation. So I was in Tennessee, in Knoxville, Smoky Mountains. And the news came across uh, that former President Donald Trump was convicted. Um, he was found guilty of 34 counts, right? Of felony, felony charges. And so, um, you know, Tennessee's a mostly red state, at least in that part. And so there was concern. There was, um, you know, warning from the front of the room at CDF to be careful out there and to know that while people might have their own feelings and opinions about this conviction, uh, to be mindful of where you were. So there were people from all across the country, you know, the, the Northeast, definitely some California folks, hello, South Sacramento, they were representing. And, um, and some people had some very partisan opinions. And so there was a warning to be aware and to be careful, right? And know where you are. Um, we were definitely in Tennessee and not everyone felt the same about that decision. Um, for, for many different reasons, I suppose. What are you hearing? Um, and I know we don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we haven't even gotten to the point of sentencing, but are, are we hearing things from parent leaders about how they're feeling about the decision or maybe questions that are coming up? What are you hearing, Sulema? Yeah, I think the big thing is where, where a lot of folks are, you know, this is a historical first, right? This is one of those, like, you will remember where you were on this day, right? Um, it, and so there's a lot that we don't yet know about what comes next. And so like some of the questions that I've been hearing are, you know, can um, former President Trump still run for, a, you know, another term? And, and the answer is yes, there's legally nothing that says we cannot have a person uh, with a, a felony conviction. Um, that, that can run for president, right? And and win. Um, and so that's all we know is yes. Uh, whether um, the convention will choose him as the, as the uh, nominee uh, for the party is something we don't know. How involved he will be in his campaign strategy um, will depend greatly on the sentencing in July. Um, and so I think there's still a lot of unknowns um, just with anything that is a historical first, we don't really know what's to come, right? Um, and uh, and so I think for folks who are curious or sort of like wondering how that it, this informs this campaign season, you know, consume whatever news uh, source you are already consuming that is trustworthy. Um, but you're gonna hear a lot of like, we don't know, right? So I've been hearing a lot of experts who are all saying the same thing. There's just no way to predict. Um, there's some, some inclinations, um, but I think that's all we can do as parent leaders is sort of like pay attention. What's the, the conversation. Yeah. Um, I've been really looking a lot at all And I also follow their Facebook to make sure that I'm not hearing, um, you know, stories that are, are extreme on either the left or the right. I really like all sides to just say like, this is what happened. Right. Um, this is what the jurors decided. This is, this is the language. Um, and it's, it's fairly objective. And I think that's the best thing we can do as parent leaders. Of course, I like my commentary, like podcasts, but, um, it's, it's also good to, to sort of hear sort of like the center line commentary, uh, and stay informed that way. Yeah. yeah. And I, I know once, I mean, another thing that I'm hearing, not necessarily from some of the parents, but, you know, out there on social media and stuff, or people are not impressed that, you know, there are these 34 counts that he was found guilty on um, for felony charges. I think people will um, have a better sense of how to feel about our justice system when it comes to the sentencing, right? So the work happened at trial. Uh, a jury of peers, or as uh, they've been saying on some of the media, you know, his neighbors convicted him. And, um, but what will the sentencing look like? We know that there are many black and brown people who are in jail for decades, a decade, two decades on one felony charge. And so what will this look like uh, for, you know, Donald Trump? 
during sentencing. And I think we will we will start to hear more, um, whether it's uh, displeasure or pleasure from people as it relates to the sentencing, because many folks have family members in prison on felony charges. Will the president Trump, uh, former president Trump be jailed? Will he be put in prison or will he be at home? So I think there's more to come on that. Um, but also it, it encourages us right in this, um, this political system. I, you know, a while ago we talked about it before on another podcast that, um, you know, Civics is not just about voting. It is about voting too, but it's also about serving on juries, right? When you get that jury duty notice, this is what that is for, right? To be a part of the process, right? To be a part of the justice system. And so um, it, it's important that we answer that call for jury duty for those of us who are privileged to get that notice, right? In years past, it'd be like, oh my goodness, they want me to be on jury duty. I don't want to do that. But we need to serve, right? This is what that is. We need to serve on juries. And it also opens us up to, um, you know, our younger generation, those folks who are um, right at that age of, I'm going to register to vote, right? Please get, yeah, parents, please get your teenagers who can, can vote, get them out there, get them registered. Um, even for adults, if you're not registered, please go register to vote. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but we have to be a part of the process where we can, because not everyone has the privilege to be a part of the process in that way, where we can cast a vote and we can sit on a jury. And so these are privileges that we have that people died and fought for that we should not go to waste. But of course it is your right to let it just go to waste. But if you want to have a better a country, a better city, better town for your children. These are the things that we need to pay attention to, right? Right, yeah. right. Yeah, as parent leaders, I think modeling how we view these duties and privileges, right? When that jury notice comes in, is it like, ugh, right? What is our attitude towards this? Because our children see that. And and so, you know, it, it's more like, OK, well, we got to do our civic duty or yay. I get to do something different. Um, and 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 I I think especially for parents to be on juries or right? I think we have a different perspective around a lot of issues um, for uh, women and people of color to be on juries. I think there's there are many juries who look a certain way and um, and I think in the outcome is not always just and fair. And so whatever we can do to further diversify the perspectives and experiences in these spaces, um, that is a part of leadership if we have this privilege and right. Um, and so, and, and I remember you wrote an article on this a couple of years ago during one of your own experiences. Um, I think we should definitely share that out because I think it really calls out some of these pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so thank you for, for putting that into this space. Absolutely. And you were talking also about like young people um, and like voter registration. And this is like a really good season. We were at a Pride event on um, Saturday talking to a lot of um, young people recently graduated, about to graduate and like really encouraging them to vote this season, to register to vote, um, pay attention to school board races where a lot of things are happening. Um, especially for this community, the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, but definitely getting our young people to vote, encouraging them to celebrate in this sort of like privilege is, is an important thing to do. All right. As we get ready to wrap things up, what else? What else is hot news out there? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is really as we're wrapping up this school season. So for us, our last day of school is tomorrow. So I'm so ready for this the a different summer routine right i'm really excited about that um but i think again another reminder that those schools are out uh your school boards and district business continues and so as a parent leader if you have a little bit of space um continue to engage attend those meetings see what's happening budgets are being approved in june in many of our school districts across the country and so um, if you haven't attended any or watched any of these meetings, this is one to, to really be a part of um, and to have a voice in sort of what's happening um, next year. And so I think that's my, my fellow parent leader call out is 
rests for those of you enjoy the summer and know that there's still a work happening. Um, and if we're not paying attention, it's happening to us, right? Um, and we're gonna enter the fall season, like what happened? What were all these changes? Uh, and that happens a lot. I see a lot of those parent forums and people are like, what in the world? Um, and so uh, just take the time, a little bit of time to sort of stay informed even in the summer months. Yeah, I, I would I would close with saying uh, for folks to, to really be listening out for what's happening with the Supreme Court um, in our parent leadership work and the Parent Leadership Training Institute, um, we really focus a lot on the legislative branch and the executive branch, not a whole bunch of the executive branch, but definitely on the legislative branch. But uh, we should not forget or neglect our attention as it relates to our judicial branch. That's our Supreme Court. That's what it's happening um, in your particular city, states, um, as, as it relates to attorney generals, all of those things, judges, we should be watching, we should be paying attention. Definitely, I think we can talk more next time about what's happening with the Supreme Court and uh, some cases around gerrymandering, also uh, uh, some of these residual things that are happening. But please, 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 your homework um, is to pay attention what's happening in your school board and education and also uh, the Supreme Court. Judicial branch is important too. Yeah, that's a great call out. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that's it for today. <laughs> I think I know we can keep talking. There's a lot going on. Um, and so we'll, we'll connect again in, in another month. And I know that you and I will be in DC once again in another week presenting on language justice. So we'll give a good update on what that work was like and, and specifically what we're um, encouraging organiza organizations to do in that space. Um, but thanks again, Melvet, for the conversation as always. Thank you, Selena. That's great. Always great being in this space with you. All right, take care till next time, everyone. Bye.